Some people say you should never sell your real estate. Do you agree? I have definitely had some properties I sold that I wish I hadn't. They went up tremendously in value and somebody else got that benefit. But then Rich and I have sold other properties that we're really, really glad we did. So when do you know when it's a good time to sell or a good time to hold? I'm Kathy Fedke and welcome to The Real Well Show. You're listening to The Real Well Show with Kathy Fedke the real estate investors resource. And thank you for joining us here on our YouTube channel. If you haven't already subscribe now, that will help you find out when we have new shows coming out. And while you're there, please remember to give us a thumbs up. It really helps us out. Well, our guest today on The Real Well Show seems to know when it's a really good time to sell a property and 1031 exchange it into new properties that increase cash flow and also have a really good chance of increasing in equity across the whole portfolio. She calls this portfolio rebalancing. It's really what we've been teaching at Real Wealth for years, but mainly in high price markets like California or New York, selling those properties and buying in cash flow markets with high growth potential like Dallas, Texas. But the team that many of our Real Wealth members have been using in Texas to build their portfolios there has been teaching people how to sell properties in the Dallas area and 1031 exchange them for higher cash flow and higher equity growth in other faster growing parts of Dallas. She calls this portfolio rebalancing, and we're going to learn a little bit more about it here on The Real Wealth Show. Welcome back. So great to have you here. Thanks for having me. Now, for years, you've been suggesting that parts of Dallas are growing really quickly. And once investors get a big pop in equity growth from their rental properties, you guide them into selling those and 1031 exchanging them into other areas of Dallas. This is kind of a unique thing. When you first told me about it, I thought it was crazy because for us, Dallas has always been more of a cash flow market and not one where you get a lot of equity growth. Well, you could see what was coming and you could see that there was actually a ton of equity growth coming because it's such a fast growing area. So let's take a moment to understand a little bit more about this portfolio rebalancing. Yeah. So one of the first things we do when we talk with the new investor is learn about their current investments. And that's really important because what what we find is that people will buy a property and it cash flows great in the beginning or it looks great on paper in the beginning. And then they just sit in it, assuming that it's going to look like that forever. And so what we do is we look at how that property is performing today and look at how much equity they have, how much their cash flow is, because what a lot of investors don't realize is that there's this disparagement between value increasing and rents increasing. And so what that means is that values often rise faster than what rents do. And the more expensive a property becomes, the more expensive it is to insure. In addition to that, when you have a property, whether it's brand new construction or whether it's remodeled, you've got all these new systems, which is great, keeps repair costs low, it makes a better kind of passive feel for ownership. But as those systems age, what happens is repairs get more and more numerous. And so what looks like great cash flow in the beginning, five, 10 years later may not be so great. Oftentimes I have investors who get to me where they've held on to the property so long that the property taxes or the costs that they're seeing in repairs eat up their cash flow and they're actually negative or almost negative. So it's very important when you own a property to constantly reassess it. I teach to do it every six months. Some of my clients do it every year. We certainly do it every time a lease is up for renewal and tell the owners kind of what's going on with the market, what the property's done. And this is something that you should get in the habit of doing on every property you have. But the kind of most most important thing, the metric that I look at the most is what we call a cash on cash return. So when you buy a property, and I'm going to use really simple numbers, let's say that you have a property that is $1,000 a month net. So maybe you have a duplex and your net cash flow is $1,000 a month. And this is a $200,000 property. And let's say that you owe only $100,000 on this home. So you've got $100,000 in equity. You're going to take that $1,000 monthly net. You're going to multiply it by 12 to get your yearly net. So that's $12,000. And you're going to divide that into all the equity that you have. So that's your value minus your loan amount. 
And that's going to give you your cash on cash return. So if you have a thousand dollar monthly profit, when you first buy that property, and maybe you only have 50,000 equity, that's a great return because you're dividing that into a really small number. Well, let's say that your value's gone up that 50,000 and now you've got 100,000 equity, but your cash flows barely moved, which is usually what happens. Sometimes it even goes down because expenses go up. Uh, what happens is your return will cut in half. And so there's really this negative of holding onto properties long term. And so we call it our two to six year model. We typically find that in markets that appreciate, you're going to see that process need to happen every two to six years. And we've actually been doing that since day one, 18 years ago. Yeah, the cash on cash return model, or I should say, what most people think of when they think of cash on cash is the cash you put into it initially. Mm -hmm. I put a 25% down payment, and that's the cash I'm talking about because it came out of pocket. But what they are, people are not seeing is the equity in the property is also your cash. And you've got to stay on top of that. And so many people don't pay attention to it at all. Now, Dallas didn't used to be a growth market. It used to be a cash flow market, and that has really changed. Do you think that will continue? Because a lot of these former cash flow markets, prices have gone up so much. Have rents gone up enough to have it still make sense today? Yeah. So one of the unique things about North Texas is our rents have skyrocketed. We're up like 40% from what we were going pre-COVID. And so houses that, you know, six, seven years ago, we were renting for 1300. Now they're renting for 1800, 1850. So we still have a great return of rents to what value is. I typically look for a number of 0.7 or higher. So the old adage where you hear that 1% rent return in a linear market, that's not having appreciation. Uh, when we have appreciation and cash flow, I like to see at least 0.7. So, uh, you know, just using really easy figures, if you've got a property that is $2,000 a month, um, you want to have, you know, that value be somewhere around 270, 280, 290. Sometimes we get close to 300 with that type of rent range. If we're going to see a property that's maybe $1,600 a month rent, we want to be in the low 200,000s. And so we hit those metrics all the time here in North Texas. So we're lucky that we continue to have appreciation and we have cash flow. One of the things that it's, it's really hard for me to help people understand understand is also the benefit of having more property. You know, a lot of people, they kind of grew up thinking, well, I want to pay my properties off. I want to pay my properties off and have no debt. Well, that's great for your personal home. I completely understand that mentality. The problem is in real estate, cash flow and appreciation is just one piece of the puzzle, right? So we've got tax benefits, you've got depreciation benefits, you've got the write-offs, you've got the increase in your net worth and your total overall assets. But the depreciation piece is probably the most important along with appreciation. So so let me kind of explain what I mean by that. So you have $100,000. You have $100,000 to go spend and you buy one property, you put $100,000 down, you've got one home. So that one home, let's say it's worth a quarter million dollars. So we got a $250,000 home, appreciates at 5% a year. Your appreciation is going to be $12,500 for that first year. If you were to take that 100000 and leverage it into two properties, well, now you've got half a million dollars in properties. You've got two quarter million dollar homes, each one, let's say, appreciating at 5%. You have just made that one year an extra 12500 just in appreciation. But in addition to that, your cash on cash return is going to be higher because when you leverage where rates are reasonable and we're back to reasonable territory now, we're seeing, as I was telling you before we started, we're seeing clients get rates in the low to mid sixes right now with minimal buy down. So especially in the conventional world, rates have rebounded a lot. They've come down. So when you do that, you double your return or more. So a house may have with leveraging maybe three or 4,000 cash flow a year. That's great. That's, that's good money, right? That's what we want. But if we're talking even at just 5% appreciation, 12,500 per house in appreciation, if you take that equity that's sitting in an extra house or that money that you have to put down and spread it, you're going to take your return in four times it or eight times it. And that's the power of reinvestment. That's the power of looking at your portfolio, looking at your equity and putting it back to use to do something greater for you instead of just sitting in one property to pay it off. Because that paying it off is not going to give you the benefit of all the power of the other things that real estate can do. I hope our listeners really understood what you just said, because this is really how real wealth was born. I, I, when I was first learning about real estate and investing and kind of looking what was it, what was available in the San Francisco Bay Area, and most of it was negative cash flow. And I had Robert Kiyosaki on the show to teach me, no, 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 you want, you want positive cash flow. It's like, oh, that was the first time I really heard about it and, and understood it. 
I cannot tell you how many people would come to me at events and say, well, my California property is cash flow. And I say, really, how is that possible? Well, I have them paid off. <laughs> it's like, well, of course they better cash flow if they're paid off. That would be a really bad situation. But that is how things started. I would, I would show people that this hundred, this, this property that's now worth a million dollars that, that you've paid down the loan to 200,000. You've got $800,000 equity sitting there that you could, you could 1031 exchange and buy 10 properties in Dallas and 10, no, I don't know about 10 X, but you would dramatically increase your cash flow and your appreciation. Cause how much more is that million dollar house going to go up versus the, the 10 houses you might get in Dallas over time? Well, and people forget too, right? So your basis is what you can depreciate off of. So if you buy this property and you sit at it, my family's really guilty of this. I come from a real estate background family and they'll buy an asset and keep it for 60 years. Well, you can only depreciate for so many years, right? And residential is 27 and a half commercial and multifamily is a little bit longer, but you're depreciating based on your original basis. So even if that property triples in value, you're not getting any tax gain on that. All of that's just sitting there wasted. There's so many reasons to reinvest a portfolio and people just get lost because they look at debt on real estate like debt on credit cards and you can't look at real estate investment debt and consumer debt the same. And so you and I both, we do a lot of retraining with people to help them understand that they're holding themselves back. People will call me and say, well, this property is cash flowing $1,000 a month. And my answer is, but you've got a half a million equity. Anything's going to cash flow if you pay down the loan enough. And that doesn't it better. It <laughs> I would also kind of, this is probably the only time I'd ever disagree with you on anything when, when you said, uh, it's maybe I understand why you'd pay off your primary. I think getting money from your primary residence is the cheapest money you'll get. Mm -hmm. And yes, I understand the so-called safety of having your home paid off. Mm -hmm. However, to me, that's not that safe because you, how are you going to protect that home? What if someone slips and falls and they could go after all of that equity if you don't have it really well protected? Um, so why not leverage it to the hilt? If you could get a five or 6% interest rate on that primary I sure hope you can find other ways to invest it where you can make more than that five or 6%. I know there's ways. I mean, do you agree? Are you on a mission to pay off your primary or do you use that money to reinvest? So I think it depends on where you are in your journey, right? So someone who doesn't have access to other capital, there's no better option than using your primary home. For some of the clients I work with who are in their 70s, they they have this eternal fear of having a loan on their primary home and, and leaving that to their heirs. So I think it really depends on someone's situation. Absolutely. If someone doesn't have the money to invest otherwise, there is no better place to tap than your primary home. For me personally, I'm in a very different position, right, than where I was maybe 15 years ago. I've got... we. Just just hit 45 million in real estate. And so um, I'm, I'm on a different journey these days. But if you go back 10 years from now, I could not for the life of me convince my husband to tap into our home's equity to, to invest. And in reality, that when we finally started doing that, when we tapped into properties equity to keep going, uh, that's where we went exponential. And that's how we went from just a couple million to 45 million in eight years. You don't realize the power of leveraging and how owning more property propels you to that next level. And so, you know, I think at the end of the day, there's this fear of debt, whatever type of debt it is. And we really just have to look at each debt type as its own type of decision. And so when someone contacts me and they've got a HELOC, I, I hear this call every day. I've got a HELOC at 4% with a couple hundred thousand available. Should I go use it to invest? It's a no brainer. It's a no brainer. You can literally take that money on the HELOC, put it in a bank account and make five and a quarter percent and make more than what that money is costing you. We call that negative interest. And that's what we were all taking advantage of, you know, when rates were in the twos and the threes and the fours. And in reality, we're barely above what the normal is. And so we're really getting back to a climate where tapping into your home's equity, tapping into your rental home's equity makes a lot of sense because you can earn more on your money than what it's actually going to cost you to borrow it. And that's the best position to be in, making money on somebody else's money. Isn't that what we all want to do? I do want to give a caveat here where if you don't know with all certainty how to make more money than what you're paying to borrow it, then don't do it. It's not safe. And people have gotten in trouble by over leveraging. If, if you're not sure how to invest it, please don't 
Don't do what we just said. Start small, uh, learn, do one deal uh, with other people's money, you know, and, and as you get better. And like you said, maybe in the very beginning, it was safer for you not to. But as you became more and more of an expert in real estate, well, then, yeah, of course, you're going to you know how to make more than four <laughs> percent if that's your borrowing costs. Yeah. And, you know, one thing I think that people have to keep in mind is that you can tap into it without overly tapping in. So some people, they'll come to me and they'll say, well, I want to tap to 80 percent. And well, you don't have to go to 80 percent. You know, if you've got a two million dollar house in California, you owe nothing on. You can tap to 50 percent and still have a million dollars to go invest. So you don't have to max leverage to take advantage of these potentials that you can do to invest. So I know you've worked with so many hundreds of our Real Wealth members Many are from California. Many didn't understand the concept of cash flow or leverage because you can't really leverage that high in California as we talked about and, and make any money. You're going to be negative cash flow. So tell me some scenarios where you've really helped our members as, as we're calling it, uh, rebalance their portfolio. Yeah, we, so I do consult calls all week, every week. And one of the first things that I do is have someone fill out a spreadsheet that tells me what they own, what they owe, what their rent is, what their expenses are, what their cash flow is. And then when they send that to me, I make them go back and edit it and add in repair costs because a lot of people think something cash flows, but it truly doesn't once you add in real expenses. And so when I look at these portfolios that people own, I tend to, obviously, with California properties, recommend a sale. And that's because there's no safe way to tap into equity and create a good investment. It really, what happens in California is you're riding the bubbles. California goes through one bubble and another and another. And if you can catch it at just the right time, sometimes you can get lucky. It's like gambling and, and buy at a low and sell at a high before it crashes or before that bubble bursts. And so a lot of people come to me with these houses that have gone up in value where maybe they have a single family rental. It's rent controlled. They're three or 4,000 a month in rent on a two, two and a half million dollar home. So I had this client that had a $2 million rental. I will never forget it. It was cash flowing at like literally not at all. I think they made 3,500 a month in rent on this $2 million home, which for someone from Texas, I have to laugh because that's like a $450,000 home here making 3,500. And yeah. they did a 1031 exchange. They brought it all here and we leveraged that at 25% down into a ton of houses. And it's it's funny because people hear 1031 and they think you're capped to three homes. That's actually not the case. There's a lot of rules that you have to follow. And one of the things we do at our company is help you navigate that and put you with an intermediary for 1031s that are going to help you follow those rules. And there's other ways you can do it too, right? You can reinvest into two with leveraging and put all the remaining cash into one, depending on what you're buying. We do fourplexes. We do small multifamily. There's so many options to make a 1031 seamless. But we took someone from a $2 million home with, you know, just awful cash flow. They were actually like negative when you put in all the repair factor and put them into a portfolio that's like $8 million. And it's it's just not hard to do. It sounds hard, but in reality, that one property you're sitting in that you've held on to, that you're just waiting for it to go up in value more despite that low rent. That one property is what can be the difference between you working and you retiring. And that is, I think, the power of what people see when they actually take that step and they take that equity and keep going. And I really want to emphasize that is what we've been doing for years. I feel like that's our superpower is taking away the fear of a 1031 because you've got 45 days to identify property. But at Real Wealth, we've got teams, people like you nationwide who can make that process much more streamlined, much easier. I, I would be afraid to do it on my own as well. <laughs> I guess you, you got 45 days to find a property. What if you sell one and you're stuck? You yeah. get to pay all the taxes. All right. One of the things that we've been seeing in the news a lot, and I really want you to give some light to it, is the what they're saying is the oversupply of property in Dallas. And you're always saying it's the opposite. But the headlines are saying that Dallas is one of the most oversupplied cities. What's What's the truth? Well, Dallas itself is not where we operate, right? Like we call it Dallas, but Dallas is massive. Dallas is over 8 million people. We work in these suburbs, these titrary markets that are outliers where all these jobs are coming in. So I'll put that into perspective for you. The One of the main areas that we work is kind of your chip manufacturing hub, the Texoma Corridor. And that area has over $35 billion being pumped in right now in development for Globotech, Finisar, IIVI, and Texas Instruments. Uh, in addition to that, there's hard rock coming in. 
in. There's Margaritaville coming in. There's one development that alone is going to double the population of one of the cities. So when we look at that, we look at something like 15,000 jobs coming into an area of less than 100,000 people. So that's 15% of the population that's increasing in the course of the next two to three years. There is not enough land being developed to build on to fill that need. Uh, are we going to be in a situation in six or seven years where maybe they start to catch up if rates come down and builders start building again? Potentially, maybe. I don't know. I don't really think the growth is going to stop TI and these other companies have said this is going to be their growth investment vehicle for the next four decades. But if you look in inner city Dallas, which is where these articles are talking about, Dallas is having net population loss. We have the second largest number of highway miles per capita in the United States. And we have this large landmass. We're the fourth largest metro, soon to be third largest metro. And we are the only affordable housing metro of your top five. Our average home price is still about $400,000. We have a ton of room to go up, and that's because we have a ton of room to grow. And so what happens is people are in Dallas where there's higher crime, where the, the politics and just kind of the, the business climate there is just not the same as what it is in the suburbs. The schools aren't as new. There's not as much funding. In our area where the money is raised is where it stays. And so your richer, nicer suburbs get all the money from their tax dollars, and they get to pump it into their schools and their programs. And so areas like where I live in Collin County, we have incredible parks and high schools that are larger than colleges. And it's it's really incredible. So there's this huge movement into the suburbs. It started with COVID. People didn't want to be in dense populated areas. And, you know, those that are moving from California, New York now, one of our top areas people are moving from to Dallas is Florida, which is crazy to me. But they get to Florida. They see the job market's not as strong as here. They come to Dallas. And so your big three are New York, uh, Florida, and California. And they get here. They don't want to go down in the city and be in this dense area they came from. They want big backyards. They want dogs. And so they go to the suburbs. And that is where the growth is happening. And that is where we focus. We do not invest in the city, the inner cities. We only invest in these outlying suburbs. That's where we can reach the numbers we want. That's where there's the housing supply shortage. Think about it this way. Dallas has enough grocery stores. They have enough schools. They have enough that they don't have to keep growing and developing to sustain any population growth. The areas that we're in, they are out of room. They are out of everything that they need to be able to sustain the growth that's coming. And it's barely even started. It's one of the fastest growing MSAs in the entire country for the last five years. So it's a very different dynamic. So although it is technically Dallas in this North Texas area, um, we're not investing in the cities. And that's a huge distinction to make. And the blessing of North Texas is, although we're a top market, we're the only top market where we don't grow from the inside out. We're the only ones that grow from the outside in. And that's a big difference. If you look at our inner suburbs, the big, big suburbs that hug Dallas, like Richardson and Plano, the very desirable ones where if you were moving here, you might want to live. They're actually having to close schools all over their suburbs because they don't have enough kids enrolling. So that's the type of difference we're talking about in population growth between these inner, inner suburbs and what's happening in these outer suburbs where we focus. Dallas overall, DFW overall is still the fastest growing area in the United States. Wow. I didn't know that about Plano. That's really interesting. Yeah, they just closed a bunch of schools and they, they can't fund to keep them open. They were at 30 to 40% occupancy. And, and is that because it's just become too expensive to live there? Oh. I mean, that's part of it. But a lot of it, too, is that people are moving. Why would you want to stay in Plano when you can go to Frisco and these other areas that are just you get a lot more for your money? You know, if you can mm -hmm. get twice the size of house, a bigger lot and a brand new home with brand new schools and all the shopping, there's so much shopping here because our cost of living is so low. And so when you look at our cost of living relative to income, so I'll put that in perspective of the new jobs coming here, 49.27% of them make more than 150,000 a year, less than 17% make less than $75,000 a year. Those are big incomes with an average home price of 400,000. And so I think that really is the big difference that people People, they want these new, beautiful, clean areas. And there's just not enough of that in Plano. In Plano, for the same type of house, you're going to spend four times as much. So I don't know that it's so much an affordability issue. It's a we're spoiled and we like our big, clean houses. <laughs> and so why not move 10 minutes further? Our highway system is incredible here. Our speed limits are 75. We have tollways. We have what we call tech express and these other types of lanes where you literally can pay more on certain highways to travel the busier it is to avoid traffic completely. And so for those that have enough money to do that, it really opens up a huge area to be able to move to. 
And it's a dynamic you don't see in any of the other top markets. And that's why they're saying that DFW is going to overtake Chicago, LA, and New York by 2100. And we will be the largest metro in the United States. And at that time, I can assure you our property values are not going to be an average home price of 400000 I'm sure you know that when I started investing in in Texas in 2004, Rich and I were buying houses in that area, not not right there, but in Rockwall for 120,000 brand new homes, 145,000 was the highest price when we bought. We didn't really see prices take off, so we let those properties go right before, right before. I mean, they they must have tripled in, if not quadrupled in value since then. More than, yeah. The Rockwall entry is like three quarters of a million. So there are times when maybe holding is better <laughs> than selling. You also have to think about how many years you would have held, right? That would have been almost 20 years. Mm-hmm. And what could you have done in 20 years with that money? And so that that's the game, though. That's the game. And, you know, when you're buying something really, really, really cheap, sometimes it does make sense to hold for longer. And that's why we recommend assessing your portfolio every year. It all goes back to what is that cash on cash return? And if someone is not hitting those metrics we want and they're not seeing that growth, then that's when it makes sense to take. Because a lot of people, they can't keep investing unless they keep using what they already have in property. So that reinvestment of that equity and that capital you've got sitting for most people is the only way to keep going. And so we have to maximize it in every way we can. And that's what we've been doing. And I know you've been doing for, you know, decades at this point. Well, we do have to wrap up, but I do have to ask one last question because we have a single family rental fund together and that you, you, you got those properties for so cheap, somewhere as low as $50,000 because it was in that moment when rates were starting to go up and the, the real estate market froze, people thought it was going to crash because rates were going up. They weren't really looking at supply demand, which is what we need to look at most. Uh, they were just like, oh, well, if rates are going to go up, that's going to crash the market. And that certainly didn't happen. So you jumped in and had zero competition. How are those properties doing today? Oh, just fantastic. I mean, the value increase is what's so incredible. We were talking on our last fund call about we've got one of ours in Collin County that's up to 300000 in value now, if not more. It, it's it's really incredible because we did this focus on Grayson County and I knew Grayson was growing and I, I gave you all the reasons. I gave you my spiel why I felt so strongly. That was before it was named the Tech Corridor. That's before the Globotech $3 billion expansion. That's before Margaritaville and Hard Rock and you know the Denison neighborhood that's doubling the population by itself. We literally could not have picked a better time. I mean, talk about Midas touch, but really in yeah. reality, what, what we've been able to do and the fund that we've been able to grow is just incredible. We, we couldn't really do it now, right? It wouldn't be the same fund. <laughs> it definitely would not be the same fund. Yeah. Yeah. It's it, timing's everything. All right. Well, it is uh, such a pleasure to have you here on the Real Wealth Show. And if people want more of you, if they want to get in touch with you, they can just go to realwealth.com. Um, you need to join. It's free. And then you'll see the drop down for Dallas. And she has uh, just served our, our members so well for uh, 13, 14 years now. Yeah, 13 years. Yeah. 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 And people just love you. So thank you again for sharing your brilliance and your insights with us here on The Real Wealth Show. Thanks for having me. Well, thank you for joining me here on The Real Wealth Show. Again, if you would like to get in contact with our Dallas team to find out how you can rebalance your portfolio, just go to realwealthshow.com. You can meet with one of our investment counselors after you join. It's free to join. Or you can just go straight to the Dallas team to get their information and find out more. I'm Kathy Fedke. Thanks again for joining me here on The Real Well Show. We'll see you next time. The views and opinions expressed in this podcast are provided for informational purposes only and should not be construed as an offer to buy or sell any securities or to make or consider any investment or course of action. For more information, go to realwellshow.com.